To start the proceedings, I'll ask Al Shaykh Faisal Ismail to correct the Holy Quran. Okay. <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولله ملك السماوات والأرض والله على كل شيء
Ladies and gentlemen, I'll just uh, let you have the format for this afternoon's proceedings. In a minute or so, I'll ask uh, Mr. Shamshad Khan, the chairman of IPCI, to say a few words. And this will be followed by a lecture from the world-renowned Dr. Zakir Naik. And this should take us up to the Maghrib prayer. And we'll stop and once the Maghrib prayers are over, then we'll have a session for questions and answers. And I shall let you have the format for that later on. I'll ask now Mr. Shamshad Khan to say a few words. Thank you. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytanu rajeem. Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. As-salatu wa salamu alayka ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmeen. Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum. Brothers and sisters, it was at the peak of the Rushdie affair when the onslaught of the media had turned against the Muslims at large. The adverse publicity against the Muslims and Islam. It was then 
that IPCI UK tried to place adverts in the national newspapers in the UK. To present the Islamic perspective relating to the freedom of speech. Needless to say that our advertisements were refused. What could we do? We pondered over and invited Sheikh Didat. Organized lectures starting from the Royal Albert Hall, extending to the major cities nationwide. We published booklets, some of you may remember, what Rushdie says about the British, can you stomach the best of Rushdie, and the same booklet under different titles. These were distributed through the major city centers nationally, and alhamdulillah, it helped to diffuse the tension. After the 11th of September, it's as though the world has turned upside down. The great adverse publicity, as seen never before, against Islam and the Muslims, undertaken by the media at large globally. What can we do? We tried yet again to place adverts in the national newspapers to present the Islamic perspective relating to terrorism. Again, our advertisements were refused. So what are we supposed to do? Our viewpoint is not heard. We are not given the opportunity to speak. There are quotations of the Holy Quran presented out of text in the major newspapers. There were mistranslations, misrepresentations printed in the major newspapers. And yet we could do or say nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Namal Usri Yusra, indeed with adversity there is ease. So IPCI UK wrote letters to the Lords of the House of Lords, to MPs of the House of Commons, to councillors nationally as well as Euro MPs, outlining the fact that, look, the ayahs, verses of the Holy Quran have been misquoted, mistranslated, presented out of context, and you owe it to yourself to read the Holy Quran, so that you may understand yourself where lays the truth. We pointed out to them that, look, you owe it to yourself what makes a friend tick. What makes an enemy tick? What makes a Muslim tick? And in order to understand what makes a Muslim tick, you ought to read the Holy Quran. We ask them that if you write to us, we shall be happy to send you this gift edition, leather bond, gold edge, with the compliments of IPCI free of charge. My dear brothers and sisters, we were overwhelmed with inquiries. Not only were we impressed by the quantity of inquiries, but also the quality. An MP wrote to us and he said, you know, I'm ashamed to say that I have never read the Holy Quran. I feel there is gap in my education. Please send me a copy of the Holy Quran, translation in English, and I promise you that I shall find time to read it.
from cover to cover. The Lord writes, he says, I was in Saudi Arabia two years ago and I was presented with a copy of the Holy Quran, but it was in Arabic and I can't read Arabic. It is therefore lying on my shelf. Please send me an English translation and I promise you that I shall study it cover to cover. We came to learn that this exercise had never been undertaken before. Brothers and sisters, it dawned upon us that we Muslims had failed to deliver the message. It is incumbent upon all of us to convey the message of Islam and we had failed. My dear brothers and sisters, not one of you has an excuse not to take part in conveying the message of Islam. The facilities are there. IPCI runs a comprehensive national DAWA program. It will take too long for me to explain, but it is a comprehensive program. All you have to do is write to IPCI, contact us or send email, and we'll be happy to send you the details, the information, the booklets, whatever you need. Equip yourself with knowledge and share it with others. We are living in this non-Muslim land. The least we can do is to share our faith with them. The least we can do is to pray for them. Who oh Allah, guide them, bring them to the fold of Islam. I want you, my brothers and sisters, to make a resolution that Allah give us the strength and the knowledge and the endeavor to try to bring at least one non-Muslim to the fold of Islam in one year. Is it too much? My dear brothers and sisters, if we were to do that, the population of Muslims in this country would double in one year. Brothers and sisters, we are here to, to hear and learn from our distinguished visitor. I will not take any more of your time. During the Rushdie crisis, we invited Sheikh Didat. <clears throat> and it is Sheikh Didat who calls Dr. Zakir Naik Didat Plus. So to combat these uh, terrorism crises, IPC has invited Dr. Zakir Naik. My dear brothers and sisters, please pray for us that his trip be successful and effective and may it help to diffuse this tension once more. Wa akhiru da'wana ni alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa rahmatullahi wa That was a message from the deepest part of Mr. Khan's heart. And I hope and pray to Allah that he'll give us the strength to follow his advice. Thank you, Mr. Khan. I will now ask Dr. Zakir Naik to continue with his lecture. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala rasulillah wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain. Amma abad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل جاء الحق وزاك الباطل إن الباطل كان زهوكا رب شهلي صدري ويسر لي أمري وهل الأقدة من لساني يفقه كولي Respected Dr. Dodi 
Brother Shamshad Khan, the respected Kari, my respected elders, and my brothers and sisters. I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. <clears throat> the topic of this evening's talk is terrorism in the name of Islam. Islam comes from the root word salam or salm, which means peace. It also means submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God. Islam in short means peace acquired by submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, the topic of this evening's talk is terrorism in the name of peace. It rather sounds a bit contradicting as though someone is saying black is equal to white or day is equal to night. But this is exactly what the media can do if it wants to do. If the media wants to call day night, they can do it. If they want to call it black, white, they can do it. The media, if it wants, it can make a very good person look like a villain, look like a bad person. On the other hand, if a media wants to make a villain look like a hero, they can do it very easily. And I have been having close encounters with the media since the past few years. And I'm aware about the media. And we ourselves are involved in making programs for the satellite television channels. And now we know that today we have a lot of misinformation about Islam on the media. There is virulent propaganda about Islam. And after the 11th of September last year, this has increased, it has enhanced. And we find that the Muslims, we are labeled as fundamentalists, as terrorists. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? A fundamentalist by definition means a person who strictly adheres to the fundamental of one particular subject or one particular ideology. For example, if a scientist wants to be a good scientist, he should know, follow and practice the fundamentals of science. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of science, he cannot be a good scientist. Similarly, for a mathematician, to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow and practice the fundamentals of maths. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of mathematics, he cannot be a good mathematician. You cannot paint all fundamentalists with the same brush, that all of them are good or all of them are bad. Depending upon in which field is the person a fundamentalist, you have to judge him accordingly. For example, if you have a fundamentalist robber whose profession is to rob, then he is a bane for society. On the other hand, if you have a fundamentalist doctor who saves thousands of human lives, he is good for the society. Depending upon in which field is a person a fundamentalist, you have to judge him accordingly. I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim because I know, I follow and I strive to practice the fundamentals of Islam. And I know that there is not a single fundamental of Islam which goes against humanity as a whole. There may be a few fundamentals of Islam which some people may think it is bad for the humanity, but the moment you give a logical reply and the reasoning for that fundamental, there is not a single human being who can point out a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. And I challenge it. I challenge anyone in the world to point out a single fundamental of Islam 
which goes against humanity as a whole. This word fundamentalism was first used, and it's mentioned in the Webster Dictionary, that the word fundamentalism was first coined to describe a group of Christians in America in the early part of the 20th century. The church initially, the church previously, they believed that the message of the Bible was from God. But these group of Christians, called as the Protestant Christians, they protested against the church and they said that not only is the message of the Bible from Almighty God, but every word, every letter of the Bible is from Almighty God. If any individual can prove that Bible is the word of Almighty God, then this movement of fundamentalism is a good movement. But on the other hand, if someone can prove that Bible is not the word of God, then this movement it is not a good movement. And if you refer to the Oxford Dictionary, it says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the doctrines of any ancient religion or scripture. <clears throat> but if you read the latest edition of Oxford Dictionary, there is a revision and it says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the doctrines of any ancient scripture or religion, especially Islam. The word especially Islam has been added in the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary. The moment you hear the word fundamentalist, you start thinking of a Muslim. You start thinking of a terrorist. As far as a terrorist is concerned, I say that every Muslim should be a terrorist. You may wonder what is Zakir speaking. Terrorist by definition means a person who causes terror. When a robber sees a policeman, he's terrified. So for the robber, the policeman is a terrorist. In the same fashion, whenever any antisocial element, any robber, any rapist sees a Muslim, he should be terrified. Every Muslim should be a terrorist to the antisocial element. I'm aware that terrorist normally means terrorizing an innocent person. In this context, no Muslim should ever be a terrorist. He should selectively terrorize the antisocial element so that the society will improve. And many a times, when an individual does a particular act, he's been given two different labels. For example, the country where I come from, India. About 50 years ago, we were being ruled by the British government. And there were many Indians who fought for the freedom of our country. These people, these freedom fighters, by the British government, they were called as terrorists. But the same people, the common Indians, we call them as freedom fighters. We call them patriots. Same people, same activity, but two different labels. If you agree with the British government that Britain had a right to rule over India, then you would call these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the view of the common Indians that the Britishers came to India to do business, they had no right to rule over us, then you would call these people as freedom fighters, as patriots. Same people, same activity, two different labels. Therefore, before giving any label to anyone, you have to first tie and analyze for what purpose is that person doing that act. Let me give you another example. We know that Nelson Mandela, the ex-president of South Africa, by the previous apartheid government of South Africa, he was called as a terrorist. And he was imprisoned in Robben Island for more than 25 years. But the common indigenous South Africans, they call Nelson Mandela as a hero. If you agree with the white apartheid government that the white color of a skin 
the white color of the skin makes a human being superior to a human being who's black in color, then we'll have to agree that Nelson Mandela was a terrorist. But if you agree with the view of the common indigenous South Africans that the color of the skin doesn't make you superior, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 13, Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu inna kalmakum inda Allah yatkakum inna Allah alimun kabir O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other not that you shall despise each other and the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa. The criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not sex, it's not wealth, it's not color, it's not caste, it's not creed, but it is taqwa. It is God consciousness, it is piety, it is righteousness. The only way one human being can be superior to the other human being is by taqwa, it is by God consciousness, it is by righteousness. If you agree with the view of Islam and the indigenous South Africans, we'll have to agree that Nelson Mandela was a hero. Same person, same activity, but two different labels. Therefore, before giving any label to any individual, you have to first analyze for what reason was he striving, for what reason was he struggling, for what reason did he do that act. In the same fashion today, we find on the media, on the international media, mainly on the CNN, even on the BBC, we find that war on terror. War on terror. And there was a Hindu journalist from India who immediately after a few days, after 11 September, she wrote a very good article and she said, that we have learned from the Americans that pigs are horses, girls are boys, and war is peace. The Americans are teaching us that the pigs are horses, girls are boys, and war is peace. Inshallah, if time permits in the question and session, I will try and prove how terrorism in the name of Islam has been done by the media, inshallah, if time permits. All of us, or most of us, we have learned in school regarding the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution propounded by Charles Darwin. And we have been taught in school that the human beings have been evolved from apes. And Charles Darwin wrote a book by the name of Origin of Species where he travels on a ship by the name of HMS Beagle and goes to an island by the name of Calatropus and there he finds that the birds they peck in niches, in holes and depending upon the holes they peck, the beak became short and long. So based on this observation, he propounded his theory of natural selection. We are taught in school though we, the name is Darwin's theory, but we are taught as though it's a fact. But the name itself suggests that it's a theory. But unfortunately in our school, we are taught that as though it's a fact. I have not come across a single book which says the fact of evolution. All of them say the theory of evolution. And Charles Darwin himself, he agreed that he did not have sufficient scientific evidence to prove his theory right. And he wrote a letter to his friend Thomas Thompson in 1880 and he writes in that letter that I believe in natural selection not because I have got evidence or proof but because it helps me in classification, in rudimentary organs, in morphology. That's the reason I remember in school days if we had to insult any of our friends we should tell him that if you were present at Darwin's time Darwin's theory would have been proved right. Trying to insinuate, he looks like an ape. In fact, there are many people who say that we can come to know from vestiges that we have been evolved from ape. In fact, 
Today, most of the scientists have agreed that Darwin's theory has been proved wrong. There are four hominoids, the Lucy with the guide Australopithecus, next was the Homo erectus, third was the Neanderthal man and fourth was Cro-Magnon. But there's no link at all that the human beings have been evolved from ape. According to P.P. Grasse, who held the chair of evolutionary studies in 1971 in the Shoja University in Paris, he said it is absurd to identify our ancestors based on few vestiges, on few fossils. Even my molecular biology, according to Hans Craig, who is one of the highest authority in the field of molecular biology, he said it is letting your imagination run too wild to assume that we have been evolved from apes. You may be wondering, why is Zakir talking about the theory of evolution? Has he forgotten that the topic is on terrorism, it's not on science? You may be wondering why is Zakir digressing away from the topic. In fact, there has been research done in the past few years. And according to research, many non-Muslims, researchers, they claim that the ideological root cause of terrorism is Darwinism and materialism. The ideological root cause of terrorism is Darwinism and materialism. You may be wondering, how can Darwinism, which speaks about the evolution of human beings from an ape, can be linked with terrorism? Most of us, we think, that Charles Darwin is the first person who proposed about the theory of evolution, and after that, everything is scientific evidence, scientific observation, scientific experiment. Everything was proved. In fact, Charles Darwin was not the first person who proposed the theory of evolution, and neither does this theory have any scientific basis. In fact, this theory of evolution, it is an adaptation of the philosophy of materialism. And this philosophy of materialism has got no scientific basis. And the theory of evolution proposed by Charles Darwin and the materialistic philosophy, it became popular. And because it became popular, the basic question which we always had in our mind, what is man? What is a human being? And the answer that we had initially, before these two theories became popular, was that the human beings have been created by Almighty God. And we have to lead our lifestyle according to the rules and regulation laid down by our Creator, Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But after these two theories became popular, the answer changed. That man came into existence by chance. And the human being has been developed in a fight for survival. The human beings have been developed in a fight for survival and we came into existence by chance. And because of this philosophy, this philosophy has given rise to racism, to communism. It has given rise to fascism. And Charles Darwin, he had a misconception that this life we are leading is a fight for survival. And he said that the development of every living creature, every living thing is based on this fight for survival. And the strong shall win the struggle and the weak shall be condemned to defeat and oblivion. Charles Darwin believed that the development of all living creatures is based on the fight for survival. And the strong shall win the struggle and the weak shall be defeated. And they'll be condemned to oblivion. And that's the reason the subtitle of his book, The Origin of Species, was based on natural selection. The other title he gave to his book was The Favored Races. He used this ideology, this philosophy, which he propounded for the animals and other living creatures, he used it to the human beings. And he said that even in the human life, there is a fight for survival, and the human beings have been developed 
from the animal, from the ape. We kept on getting developed, 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 and now from an animal, we have become a human being. And he called that even today, the human beings are further developing. And he said that there is a favored race amongst the human being. And according to Charles Darwin, the favored race were the white Europeans. And the Africans and the Asians, they were not the favored race. And slowly, the African and Asians, they'll be defeated. And later on, they will become extinct. And only the white Europeans, they will survive. And because of Charles Darwin, he influenced many of the human beings to let aside the religious philosophies of human nature, etc. And that's how it gave rise to fascism, communism, and terrorism. And according to an Indian anthropologist by the name of Lalita Vidyarthi, she says that Charles Darwin influenced the social sciences in the 19th century. And by the end, by the second half of the 19th century, the Europeans, they agreed and they started believing that they were the favored races. And Charles Darwin himself, he was influenced by a book written by a British economist by the name of Thomas Malthusis. The name of the book was An Essay to the principle of population. And many of us are aware about the Malthusian theory. And Malthus is according to his own calculation, he wrote in this book that the population of the human beings is increasing. And the only way this population increase can be stopped is by disaster. Is by disaster. And disaster in the way of war, famine or disease. So Malthus said that if human beings have to survive, certain people have to be sacrificed. If human race has to survive, there has to be disaster, there has to be war, there has to be diseases, there has to be famine. And all this research I'm talking about, you can find that mainly it has been done by the non-Muslims. If you go on the internet, you'll find that James Pussy, Alan Woods, Robert Young, James Wool, all these non-Muslim philosophers and, and researchers, they have written all these articles. And this has been compiled very well by a Muslim by the name of Harun Yahya. And you'll find this book also in the market and even on the internet you can go. All this mainly, the research has been done by the non-Muslims. And it has been compiled very well by Harun Yahya. And this Malthusian theory, by the early part of the 19th century, there's an article which is written, The Secret Agenda of the Nazis. And here, the white upper class Europeans, they unanimously got together and they agreed that they were the favored race. And for them to survive, they have to come with a strategy. And they came with a strategy that though they knew that unhygienic condition and poverty leads to death, but because of the selfishness and because of this theory, they wanted to survive and they saw to it that they encouraged diseases amongst the poor people. They encouraged that the poor people live together, many people in a small house. They encouraged narrow streets in the village of the poor people. They encouraged the poor people to build their homes in marshy lands. And this is very well evident when there was a law passed in Britain in the 19th or 20th century in which it encouraged young poor boys of the age of 6, 7, 8, 9 years of old. They worked for about 16 to 18 hours in coal mines and unhygienic conditions due to which, if you read the records, thousands and hundreds of thousands of poor boys were killed. Because of this philosophy, this racism 
terrorism and fitness has increased. And you find that all the wars, majority of the wars that are fought, who are the people being killed? Majority, if you take it as a whole in the past century, the majority of the wars, who are the people being killed? The poor people, the Asians, the Africans, the white people, the Europeans, they are safe. It is a strategy. So because of this Darwinism, Maslow's theory and materialistic philosophy, it encouraged the human beings to go away from the religious philosophies, to go away from the law our Creator has laid down and that's the reason we have the scenario that we have today in the world. All this has been documented. You can go on the internet and you'll find enough material multiple times more. And today, there's a misconception as far as the word jihad is concerned. And this misconception is not only in the minds of the non-Muslims, it's even in the minds of the Muslims. That whenever a Muslim fights a war, irrespective whether it is be whether it is for his personal ego, for nationality, for region, for language, it is called as jihad. Muslims and non-Muslims alike, most of them, they think that if a Muslim fights a war, it is jihad. Irrespective whether it may be for personal reasons, it may be for nationality, it may be for language, it may be for region, it may be for a race, it's called as jihad. Jihad is an Arabic word which literally means to strive, to struggle, to exert an effort. And jihad in the Islamic context, broadly, it encompasses striving against one's own evil inclination. It even includes striving to improve the society at large. It even includes striving in the battlefield in self-defense. It even includes fighting against oppression and tyranny. Jihad is an Arabic word which comes from the root word jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. Jihad simply means to struggle. If a student struggles in the examination to pass, it's called as jihad. If an employee struggles to satisfy his employer, whatever work he may be doing, good or bad, it's called as jihad. If a politician strives to win the election, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it's called as jihad. Many of the people have a misconception that jihad can only be done by the Muslims. Jihad is a plain Arabic word which means only to strive or struggle. And the Quran mentions that the kafirs, that the unbelievers, they did jihad. Allah SWT says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Quran, chapter number 31, verse number 14, that we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In travail upon travail did the mother bore them, and in years twain was the weaning. The next verse, Surah Al-Quran, chapter 31, verse number 15 says, that, but if the parents strive, do jihad, to make you associate partners with me, which you have no knowledge of, do not obey them. The same message repeated in Surah an kabut chapter number 29, verse number 8. We have enjoined on the human beings to, the, to be good to the parents. But if the parents do jihad, strive to make you associate partners with me, of which you have no knowledge, do not obey them, but live with them with love and companionship. Here the Quran says that the non-Muslim parents, they are doing jihad to make the children do shirk. So here the Quran says that non-Muslim do jihad. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa chapter number 4, verse number 76, that the believer does jihad fi sabilillah, striving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the unbeliever does jihad fi sabi shaitan, striving in the way of the evil person. So jihad only means to strive. What we Muslims should do is jihad fi sabilillah, strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what the unbelievers do, very often, is jihad fi sabi shaitan, that is striving 
in the way of the evil one, striving in the way of the Satan. So jihad normally means only to strive to struggle. But in the Islamic context, if it is not specified, it's taken for granted that jihad means jihad fi sabilillah. If not specified. And there is another misconception among the Muslims as well as non-Muslims. That jihad means a holy war. You will not find a single verse in the glorious Quran. Neither a single authentic hadith in which jihad has been described as a holy war. Because holy war in Arabic means harbu mutakasm, harbu, or the holy war. Al harbu, al muqaddasatu, the holy war. Nowhere will you find this word for jihad described in Arabic in the Quran or in the Hadith. This word, the holy war, was actually used to describe the Christian crusaders. The crusades are done by the Christians, which today, unfortunately, many of the Muslim writers unknowingly they use this word holy war even for jihad. Nowhere in the Quran, nowhere in the authentic hadith has jihad been described as holy war. And neither is jihad always means fighting. The word for fighting or killing, it means qatal in Arabic, to do qatal. And jihad always is not qatal. Yes, sometimes jihad can mean fighting. If you are striving to fight against tyranny, against oppression, that is one type of jihad. So qital can be one type of jihad, but all jihad is not qital, and all qital is not jihad. Neither is all fighting jihad. If it's only fighting in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fighting against oppression, fighting against tyranny, to fulfill the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it can be called as jihad fi sabilillah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah says in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 78, that strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as you ought to strive. For Allah has chosen you and He has made no difficulties in your religion. Allah says, strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as you ought to strive. Do jihad in the way of Allah, jihad fi sabilillah, as you ought to do. That means there are people who are doing jihad who are not doing proper jihad. And Allah says, He has chosen you. And Allah says that He has not made any difficulties in your deen, in your religion. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 20, Allah says that a believer who suffer who suffers exile and who strives with might and main in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with goods and with persons these are the people to achieve the highest reward in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and these are the pe people to attain salvation Allah says that if you do jihad with your might and main with your wealth and person in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these are the ones to attain felicity and our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in the Hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number 4, Hadith number 46, that the Prophet said that a Mujahid, a person does Jihad, and Allah knows best whether is he doing Jihad in the way of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala or not. A Mujahid is a person who is somewhat like a person who's continuously fasting and giving zakat and praying. The Prophet said, a mujahid, a person who does jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he continues, Allah alone knows whether he is actually striving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. Many of us give fatwa or jihad or not. Allah alone knows whether he is doing jihad or not. He is like a person who is continuously praying and fasting. And he continues that if a mujahid dies in the battlefield, then Allah will grant him paradise. Or else, he will return back home safely with blessings and with booty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes jihad in various verses of the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 6, that 
Anyone who does jihad does for his own self. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from any need in the universe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require any of your support. He alone is sufficient. So Allah says, if you do jihad, you do for your own benefit. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 24, Kul in kana abawkum, say with the beef your fathers, wa abnaukum, or your sons, wa ikhwanukum, or your brothers, wa azwajukum, or your spouses, your wives or husbands, wa ashiratukum, or your relatives. Allah says, what are your considerations? Are they your fathers? Are they your sons? Are they your brothers? Are they your spouses, your wives and husbands? Are they your relatives? And Allah continues. The wealth you have amassed, the business in which you deal, the house in which you live. Allah is asking, what are your considerations? Are they your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your spouses, your relatives, the wealth you have amassed, the business in which you deal, the house in which you live? And Allah continues. Ahabba ilaykum min Allahi wa rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabilihi. If you love all these things more than Allah, His Rasul, and doing jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says, Fatarabbasu, you wait. And we Muslims are waiting, sitting on the backside doing nothing. When Allah says wait, what does He actually mean? For example, if in a school, if a senior student is bullying a junior student, and the junior student tells the senior student, wait, till I get my elder brother. And his elder brother happens to be the biggest hooligan of that area. What the junior student is telling the senior student is, he's actually warning him, that you better buzz off. You better vanish. Otherwise you'll be taught a lesson. Similarly, when Allah says, wait, Allah is giving you a warning. فَتَرَبَّسُوا حَتَّى يَعْتِي اللَّهِ بِأَمْرِي وَاللَّهُ لَا هَذُكُمُ الْفَاسِقِينَ Wait until Allah brings his decision unto you. Wait until Allah brings his destruction unto you. Wallahu ila izulkum al-fasikin. And Allah guides not the fasik people. Allah is saying that if you love all these eight things more than Allah, his Rasul, and doing jihad, striving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wait until Allah brings his destruction to you and Allah guides not the fasik people. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Muhammad, chapter number 47, verse number 38. Wa inta tawallaw. Yes, tabli kaum an gairakum. Summa laknam salakum. If you do not do your job, if you turn away from Allah's path, Allah will substitute in your place another people. Summa laknam salakum. And they will not be like you. If you run away from your duty, if you turn away from Allah's commandments, Allah will substitute in your place another people. Summa laknam salakum. And they will not be like you. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there are various hadith in which, this, in which he has described about jihad. If you read the hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, volume number 4, hadith number 2784, in which Hazrat Aisha may Allah be pleased with her, she tells the Prophet that the best deed is jihad. And should we join jihad? Should we go and join jihad? And the Prophet says and replies to her, the best jihad is perfect hajj. Means performing hajj perfectly is the best jihad. On another occasion, the Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, hadith number 5972, a person approaches the Prophet and says, I want to go for jihad. The Prophet asks him, he asks the man, that do you have parents? He says, yes. For you, Jihad is serving your parents. You know what the Prophet says? The best jihad for that man was serving the parents. We have the other hadith that's mentioned in Sunnah Nisai, hadith number 4206, in which the Prophet, when a man asks, that which is the best jihad? The Prophet says, saying a word of truth against a ruler who is a tyrant who does operation, that's the best jihad. You have another hadith mentioned of the beloved Prophet in Sahih ibn Abban, in which the Prophet said that a mujahid is a person who strives and struggles against his own self for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And the Prophet continues that a muhajir, a person who migrates, is the person who migrates from the evil towards the right cause. So here we find in the various authentic hadith of the Prophet that the best jihad keeps on changing depending upon the situation. Once the Prophet said to his wife, Allah, may Allah be pleased with her, that the best jihad is perfect hajj. On the other occasion, the Prophet said that serving your parent is the best jihad. On the other occasion, the Prophet said that saying a word of truth against a ruler who is a tyrant is the best jihad. So depending upon the situation, the best type of jihad will change according to the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 208, that, Ya ayyuhal lazina amun, utkhlu fi salmi kaffa, Oh, you believe? Enter into Islam wholeheartedly. Allah says that you have to enter into Islam wholeheartedly. And follow not the khutwat of shaitan, the footsteps of the devil. What does Allah mean that follow not the footsteps of the devil? You know, there are many times Allah says that be careful of the devil, etc. But here Allah says, do not follow the footsteps of the devil. What is the difference? See, for a man of taqwa, if the Satan comes in front of him, for example, if a young girl comes and tells him that let's spend the night together, the man of taqwa will say, no, this is the Satan, and he will on the spot refuse. On the other hand, the same person who has taqwa but may not have a very high level of taqwa, you know, he wouldn't mind speaking to a girl on the phone, you know, and he speaks to the girl on the phone. After a few days, they say, let's have tea in a restaurant. The next day they go, to McDonald's. After a few days, they spend the night together in the hotel. Here, this is khutwa to shaitan. That first the phone call, then the tea, then the dinner, then the hotel. So if you put a stop at the beginning, the footsteps of the devil, it will save you from the devil himself. So ya Allah says, do not follow the footsteps of the devil, the khutwa to shaitan. To those who have certain level of taqwa, iman, if the Satan himself comes directly, because of the level of Iman you have, you will refuse the Satan on the spot. But the footsteps of the devil may mislead you. And the devil, the shaitan, is after those who have taqwa, those who have Iman. He's more after them to mislead them. So we as Muslims, besides being careful of the devil, we should even be careful of the footsteps of the devil. And the Prophet Muhammad said, that if you see an evil act, the best you can do is stop it with your hand. If you cannot do it with your hand, if you cannot stop it with your hand, at least try and stop it with words, with your mouth. If you cannot do that also, the least you can do is curse in your heart. That the act is wrong. And if you do that, you are the lowest level of moment. And the least you can do is at least curse in your hand, curse in your heart, then you become the lowest level of moment. And the best form of jihad today that we have, according to me, is da'wah. Conveying the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Conveying the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to those who are not aware of it, so that we could change the scenario of the world. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, Allah says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhridat lil nas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people evolved for mankind. Allah is giving us an honor. Allah is calling us Khaira Ummah, the best of people. Whenever there is honor, it is always followed up with responsibility. There is no honor without responsibility. For example, in a school, the principal has got more honor than a teacher. A teacher has got more honor than a clerk. Similarly, the principal has got more responsibility than a teacher. A teacher has got more responsibility than a clerk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran calls us khaira ummah, the best of people. Don't you think we have a responsibility? The reply is given in the same verse. Allah says, Because we enjoy what is good, and we forbid what is wrong, and we believe in Allah. Allah is calling us khaira ummah because we are supposed to enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. If we do not enjoy what is good and if we do not forbid what is wrong, we are unfit to be called as Muslims. We are unfit to be called as khaira ummah. Dawah is compulsory for every Muslim. 
And it is one of the requirements for you to enter Jannah. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Asr, chapter 103, verse number 1 to 3. Wal Asr, inna al-insala fi khusr, illa lazina amanu, wa amilu salihati, wa tawasaw bil haqqa tawasaw bil sabr. That by the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, that is to dawa, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. These are the minimum four criteria required for any human being to go to Jannah. Iman, righteous deed, dawa, and exhorting people to patience. If anyone is missing, you may be a very good Muslim, you may be offering salah five times a day, you may have performed hajj, you may be giving zakat, but if you don't do dawa, if you do not convey the message of Islam to the non-Muslim, according to Surah Al-Asr, you cannot enter Jannah. If Allah wants to forgive you and then put you in Jannah, that's a different question. For Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 48 and Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse 116 that if Allah pleases, He can forgive any sin, but the sin of shirk He will not forgive. So if Allah wants to forgive you, that's a different question. But under normal circumstances, if you don't do dawah, you shall not enter Jannah. Only doing dawah though is not sufficient. All four are equally important. Iman, righteous deed, dawah, and exhorting people to patient perseverance. It's the duty of every Muslim that should convey the message of Islam to those who are not aware of it. And today we find that the media is attacking Islam and they're quoting verses out of context and one of the most common verses quoted from the Quran out of context is Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 verse number 5 which says that after the four forbidden months are over kill the kafirs the unbelievers wherever you find them and wait for them in every stadium of war quoting this verse in isolation makes a human being feel that the Quran says to the Muslims, wherever you find the non-Muslim, you kill them. And wait for them in every strategy of war. Now if you read the context of this verse, it says, if you read the first four verses of Surah Tawbah, it speaks about a peace treaty between the Muslims and the Mushriks of Makkah. And this peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the Mushriks of Makkah. And by the time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaches verse number 5, He gives them a warning, an ultimatum. And He tells to the Mushriks that to put things straight in four months time, otherwise a declaration of war. And then in the battlefield Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Mormons, to the believers, to the Muslims, that wherever you find the enemies, the unbelievers, fight them, kill them. Now, this is the instruction given in the battlefield. For example, if the President of America or the Army General of America, when the war took place between America and Vietnam, if the Army General or the President of America told the American soldiers in the battlefield that don't get scared, kill the Vietnamese wherever you find them, it sounds very logical. But today, if I quote out of context and tell that the President of America says that wherever you find the Vietnamese, kill them, I will make him sound like a butcher. It's out of context. And it is but natural that any army general to boost up the morals of the soldiers will say that wherever you find the enemies, don't get scared. He will not say that get scared. He'll have to say that don't get scared. Wherever you find the enemies, kill them. It's but natural. It is in the battlefield. And one of the staunchest critics of Islam in India, his name is Arun Shuri, and he has written several books against Islam. And one of his famous books, the world of fatwas, he quotes this very verse. Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 verse number 5 and indicates that the Quran says wherever you find the kafirs in bracket indicate the Hindus, you kill them. And after verse number 5, he jumps to verse number 7. Any logical person will realize that verse number 6 of Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 has the answer to the, answer to the problem, has the key to the problem. Verse number 6 says that if the unbelievers, if the kafirs, seek asylum, give it to them and escort them to a place of security so that they shall hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran does not say that if the enemies, if the kafirs want peace, want asylum, let them go. It says if they want peace, escort them to a place of security 
I'm asking today in this age, which army general, even if he's generous, the maximum will say that let the enemy go. Which army general today will say that escort the enemy to a place of security? Which army general? And this is what the Quran says. So the critics of the Quran, they quote the verse out of context and they make it look as though Islam is a religion which encourages terrorism against the innocent people. And in fact, if you read the verse of the Quran, there are various rules and regulations laid down for a war, for a jihad, for a kital fi sabilillah. There are various rules and regulations laid down. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, if anyone kills any human being, unless it be for murder or for creating mischief in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. Quran says, that anyone kills any human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for creating mischief in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves any human being, it's as though he has saved the whole of humanity. That means the Quran prohibits any human being, any Muslim, to kill any other human being unless it be for murder or for creating mischief. So if these verses are read, it will surely clarify the misconceptions that the non-Muslims have. And further, if you read in the Quran, and if you see the lifestyle of the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu you will really find out from his lifestyle that half of his prophethood was in Makkah, the latter half was in Medina. And you find that during the Makki Zindagi, during the Makki Dor, the time he spent his life in Makkah, you find that he was more involved in spreading the message of Islam doing da'wah to the non-Muslim. And there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give permission for Qital. Did not give permission for Qital fi sabilillah, firing the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For Qital fi sabilillah, it has to be following the guidance of the Quran and the Sunnah. Otherwise it is not Qital fi sabilillah. And here we find that there were Sahabas, for example, Hazrat Hamza may Allah be peace with him and various other Sahabas who were very strong fighters. When they saw that the other Sahabas were being tortured, they wanted to retaliate, but they had no permission from Prophet and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine if someone troubles your family members and if you go and take revenge, that is good. But if someone tells you you cannot go and take revenge and yet you control yourself, do sabr, that is a greater jihad. Because they had no permission from Allah and His Rasul. So they controlled themselves. They wanted to retaliate, but the jihad for them was sabr. They had no permission from Allah and His Rasul. That was the jihad they did. And later on, at the time of the lifestyle in Medina, later on when Allah's revelation came, and when the Muslims, mashallah, when the, when the moment was right, when the portion was right, at that time, Allah gave the permission for Qital fi sabilillah, fighting against tyranny, fighting against oppression. And even during a Qital fi sabilillah, Allah says in the Quran, Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 90, that fight against those who fight you, but do not commit excesses, but do not transgress the limit. Allah gives you permission to fight, but does not give you permission to transgress limit. And there were rules and regulations laid down by Allah and His Messenger. And you find that when the Messenger gave permission, He said that in the battlefield, during battle, during Kitar fi sablillah, do not harm the women, the children, the elderly men who do not fight you. Do not fight the religious people, the monks. Do not destroy the place of monastery, the temple, the synagogue, the churches. Do not burn the crops. Do not uproot the trees. Do not kill the animals. I have not read any manual of war which says all these things. Believe me. You will not read any manual of war today in this modern age which says that you should not uproot trees, that you should not burn the crops, that you should not kill the animals, that you should not harm the women folk, the children, the men, do not destroy the places of worship. 
These are the guidelines laid down in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. It's our duty that we convey this message to those who are not aware of it. And Allah says in the Quran further in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 93, that fight those who fight you until there is no more tumult and operation. Means you have to fight till there is no tumult and operation. Once operation is over, the Kitab of Sablillah should stop. And there is a common misconception in the Western media that Islam was spread by the sword. And as I mentioned, that Islam comes from the root word Salam or Salm, which means peace. It also means submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In short, Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. Islam is a religion which wants to spread peace. It wants to maintain peace throughout the world. And to maintain peace, Islam gives permission that sometimes as a last resort, force can be used to maintain peace. And if you analyze every state, every government, every country has a force. They have the police, which many a times uses force to fight against the criminal so that peace will be maintained in that country, peace will be maintained in that state. Every country has a police. And this police uses violence, uses force to let peace prevail. Similarly, Islam is a religion which spreads peace. It is against violence, but as a last resort, if that is the only way in which peace can be maintained, Islam gives permission for Kitar Fi Sabilillah, for fighting, for using force as a last resort to let peace prevail in this world. And the best reply to this misconception that Islam was spread with the sword is given by Dilesi O'Leary in his book Islam at the Crossroad on page number 8 and he says history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world and forcing those they conquered races at the point of the sword is the most absurd fantastic myth that historians have ever repeated and we know that we Muslims, we ruled Spain for about 800 years. We didn't force anyone to accept Islam in the point of the sword. Later on the crusaders came and they wiped out the Muslims. There was not a single Muslim who could openly give the azan. We Muslims, we are the lord of the Arab land for the past 1400 years. For a few years the Britishers came, for a few years the French came, but overall we have been the lord of the Arab land for the past 1400 years. In spite we were the rulers for the past 1400 years, yet today there are more than 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christian means Christians since generation. These 14 million Arab Coptic Christians, they are giving Shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was inspired by the sword. The Muslims, we ruled India for about a thousand years. And today, more than 80% of the Indians, they are non-Muslims. These 80 person non-Muslim Indians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was not spread by the sword. If we wanted, we could have forced every non-Muslim Indian to accept Islam at the point of the sword. We didn't do it. These 80 person non-Muslim Indians, they are giving shahada, they are bearing witness that Islam was not spread by the sword. Indonesia, the country which has the maximum number of Muslims, which Muslim army went to Indonesia? Which Muslim army went to Malaysia, which has more than 50% Muslims? Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? Which sword? The reply is given by Thomas Carlyle. Sword. Which sword? Every new idea originates in the mind of one. In one man's head it dwells alone. One man against the full world. One man against all the human beings. It will do little good that he picks up a sword and propagates it. You have to first find your sword. He's talking about the sword of intellect. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, Udu wal mu'azit al-hasna, ahsan. Invite all the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. This is the sword of intellect which is conquering the hearts. And we find today, there was an article which came in the Real Digest Almanic Yearbook in the year 1986 
which was repeated in the Plains with magazine, it gave the increase in the population of the major world religions. And number one increase was Islam in a span of 50 years from 1934 to 1984. Number one was Islam 235%. Christianity only 47%. I am asking a question, which war took place in this span of 50 years which forced the non-Muslim to accept Islam? Which war? Today, the fastest growing religion in America is Islam. The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. I am asking a question, who is forcing these Americans? Who is forcing the Europeans to accept Islam at the point of the sword? Who is forcing them? Allah promises in the Quran, in no less than three different places. Allah says twice in Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9, and Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33, Allah says, Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other isms, whether it be Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, secularism, modernism. Islam is destined to supersede all, overcome them all, master them all. How much the Muslims don't like it. And Allah repeats the message the third time. In Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28, where he says, Huwa allazi arsa rasoolahu biluda wa din al-haq liyuz hira wa al-dine kulli wa kafa billahi shayda. That Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, over all the other isms, whether it be Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, secularism, modernism, atheism. Islam is destined to supersede all. Kulle, master them all, overcome them all. Waqafa billahi shayda. And enough is Allah as a witness. And I started my talk by quoting a verse of the Quran from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, which says, Waqul jal haq wa zakal batil. When truth is hurled against falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. I would like to end my talk by giving the quotation of Dr. Adam Pearson who says that people who worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs, they fail to realize that the Islamic bomb has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. To be on questions and answers, and please let me set out the format for you. Please ask questions only on the topic of the day. Questions irrelevant to the topic will not be answered. Questions which are of a general nature about religion will also not be answered. <clears throat> and kindly put your points briefly and stick to facts only. The way we are going to work is we would like you to come around to, to my right here and make a queue and two or three gentlemen there will guide to the individual who's holding the microphone and please put your questions directly to the chair. Please give your name and if you hold an appointment please say who you are or state your profession. Many thanks. Um, ladies and gentlemen, in the first instance we're going to take verbal questions and if and when there is time left, then we'll deal with the questions that have been written and given to us. I have a lot of them, so we'll try and answer as many as we can. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Those are questions out of the topic, and the chairperson gave me permission. Since the brother asked me the question before Salah, then why are you wearing the tie? Isn't it haram? It's a sign of Christianity. It's a sign of Salib. It's a sign of cross. So how come you being a die wearing it? And I said that you can ask in public. He said, no, it's a personal question. I said, 
Adai is life should be an open book. Regarding the question that can a person wear, can a Muslim wear a tie? According to the Islamic Sharia, there are six criteria to be fulfilled for hijab. The first is the extent which differs between the man and the female. For the male is from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. Some scholars say even this should be covered. The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The second is the clothes they wear, it should not be tight so that it reveals the figure. Third, it should not be transparent so that you could see through. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And sixth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. And there are many Muslims who think that tie is a sign of cross. According to the Islamic Sharia, you cannot wear any sign which is a symbol of that religion. If a person wears a cross, it is haram in Islam. If a person wears om, which is a sign of Hinduism, it is prohibited. If a person puts a tikka, a vermilon, which is a sign of Hinduism, it is prohibited. But the question is, is tie a symbol of cross? In fact, I have not come across a single authentic Christian book which says tie is a sign of Christianity. I have read the Bible. There is no verse in the Bible saying that tie is a sign of Christianity. In fact, if you read the Encyclopedia Britannica, the Encyclopedia Americana, it says that this was a fashion used in the olden days and it came from the craviot. You know the craviot person wore. And in some countries it was used to tie up the cold clothing. And later on it got converted into a fashion. There is no proof at all that tie is a sign of Christianity. This is concocted by certain Muslims, certain group of Muslims who are against the Western world. Even I am against certain Western culture. What is wrong, you should be against it. But what is not wrong, you cannot go against it. In fact, there was a research done in Riyadh, a PhD, a student, one of the friends of Dr. Bilal Phillips. He did a PhD on research on tie and he tried to find out the link, where does it actually meet with the cross and he could not find it all. It is a misconception that certain Muslims who are against the Western culture, they spoke against the tie. In fact, tie is not a sign of Christianity at all. It is a cultural dress. It's a fashion. Islamic Sharia gives you permission. You can follow any culture as long as it doesn't go against the Islamic Sharia. For example, if someone says, I want to wear shorts. See, shorts is against the Islamic Sharia. So though it's a Western culture, but because it goes against the Islamic Sharia, it is prohibited. But tie is not a sign of Christianity at all. So wearing it is not first. It is not sunnah also. It is mubah. Mubah is optional. You won't get any sawa for that. I don't recommend anyone to wear a tie. And neither do I always wear it. But because when I travel in the Western country, then because I come on the satellite, I feel that it impresses the non-Muslims. You cannot do anything haram to impress the non-Muslim. But what is halal, what is mubah, you can do it. That's the reason I wear a tie. In India, normally I don't wear. It's no problem at all. If you don't want to wear a tie, no problem at all. But if someone wants to wear a tie, no problem also for that. And you should realize that people are so much against the Western culture. They say, no shirt is haram and pant is haram. In fact, the word shirt is mentioned five times in the Quran. In Surah Yusuf, it is mentioned four times. If you know the story of Yusuf and Zulekha, may Allah be pleased with them both, how they, how he chased and the shirt tore from behind. So the word kameez is there in the Quran. And in India, they think kurta pajama is a sunnah. There's no hadith in which the Prophet wore kurta pajama. In fact, there's a, there's a verse of the Quran talking about kameez shirt. The shirt may differ than the way we are wearing. And furthermore, if you analyze the tobe, which we the Arabs wear, so tobe, if you put the hand on top, that looks like a salib. It looks like a cross, yes or no? So does it mean you stop wearing the tobe? No, because tobe was never used as a sign of Christianity. So though tobe looks like a cross if you put your hands on top, but that's not haram at all. So before saying it is prohibited, you should have enough evidence. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 111, Produce your proof if you're truthful. If anyone can prove me authentic proof from any Christian scripture, that tie is a sign of Christianity, of any authentic source, I will stop it and I will tell the other people to stop it. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. If you have a question, please go to the end of the queue and you will have your turn to answer. We will not take any questions from the floor. Excuse me, please do not interject. Let the speaker finish his answers. And then if you have a question, you are more than welcome to come and join the queue. Thank you very much. And may we have the next question, please. Uh, 
Young man, may I just interrupt you? I'm afraid that is not the topic of the day. Insurance has not got anything to do with the, today's topic. And so I'm afraid I will not take that question from you. Thank you. The, that was an exception to the rule because it had been arranged previously. I'm, I'm sorry to say that, okay? Thank you. So may we have the next questioner, please? Would you, would you kindly, the time is very limited, so please make your, make your point very quickly. Thank you. I could see very clear that in the hand, in Islam, there is a the rules of the hand, and I could go to many verses the doctor had mentioned with not correct contents. She had a pital was prescribed not against oppression. Pital was prescribed the alaq and the land. By the Ushimi. I think in these days, in this particular moment, we have to understand what she has. So we could help ourselves not only to stand against the oppression, but also to promote Islam. This is what Allah prescribed to that, to the life of the What of the Lord? Few verses the doctor had mentioned want to do with refugees. And Allah said in the Quran, Hatta Yisma'ala Allah. There is a big difference between those persons which were revealed in Mecca and those persons which were revealed in Medina and more particular persons who were revealed in the four other persons. I will say, it has to be very, very clear. It seems to us these days that Muslims who worry so much about the media when they think of us, but we have to give up our deal, our identity as Muslims. We need to understand and recognize ourselves as the Prophet said. Thank, 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 thank you, Jim. Thank you, sir. You, excuse me, I am sorry, can you just hold on a second and let me interrupt? I'll give you the chance, but you have not asked a question yet, so I accept that, but please ask your question. Can you ask your question now, please? Because you have not asked a question. The question, my question, you have to decide what the things you say that you have or doubt is the best form of what you have. There is not a single person of Quran, nor in the Hadith that there are forms of jihad, but there are marathons of jihad, and there is nothing in the Sunnah or in the tradition of the Prophet or in the Quran as the, the levels of jihad. No. Thank you. Jihad. We'll get Dr. Nag to answer your question. Thank you. The brother has made several comments in the first part of his question, and he said that I quoted many verses of the Quran out of context, and he said that jihad is never used against Tarian oppression. He said that. But I don't say that. Allah says, and I'm quoting your reference. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 90 to 93, Allah says, fight against those who fight you, but do not transgress. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 93, Allah says, that fight until there's no more tumult and oppression. So Qital, one of the way for Qital is to fight tumult and oppression. Allah says, I don't say that. If you don't agree with Allah's kalam, that's your problem. And regarding, please brother, you have asked your question. Please give me the time to answer. Be like a good Muslim. If you have a second question, you can go behind the queue and wait for a second chance. There's not a debating time. You ask a question, I'm giving the reply. If you like my reply, keep it. If you don't like my reply, throw it away. It is not, it is not far that you should agree with my reply. And you're not allowed to interact and please Otherwise, we'll have a debate session with so many people. If you can go behind the queue and wait for a second chance, that would be preferable. And please let me complete the answer. And he said that jihad is only to fight against the mushrikeen. That means jihad should only be to fight the mushrikeen. Yes, it can be if the mushrikeen is doing tumult and operation. In fact, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mumtahina, chapter number 60, I'm quoting the reference. Chapter number 60, verse number 8, 9, and 10. Allah says in the Quran that if the mushrik, if the kafir, Allah forbids you, Allah forbids you not to be unjust with them. If the mushrik and the kafir fight you not against your faith and drive you not out of your, out of your home, 
is if the kafir and the mushrik drive you not out of your home and fight you not your faith Allah forbids you from doing unjust for Allah loves those who love justice that means Allah says that if the kafir and the mushriks fight you not and drive you not out of your home and fight you or not fight you not with your faith then deal with them with justice and the next verse says but if the kafir and the mushriks fight you fight your religion and drive you out of your home Allah forbids you to go to them for protection and for help this is what Allah says so the kital is not only to fight the mushriks it to fight the mushriks if they are against if they're fighting against you if they're doing tumult if they're doing operation so just quoting one verse out of context you have to read the Quran as a whole and I've given you references and you can keep on quoting several references from the Quran and the Hadith that it is mainly if someone goes against and it is to let peace prevail in the world hope that answers the question I'm sorry once you may I please in interrupt you again may I suggest to you that once you have asked your question please leave the front of the queue and go back to the queue this is not a debate between two individuals I'm sorry but I'm not going to allow you to go I'm sorry but please will you leave and let and go and let the next gentleman ask the question would you please be as Dr. Naika said let's all be good Muslims and let's behave sir thank you very much thank you again thank you would you please let somebody next please thank you The brother asked a question that is it right that we ban certain products like Pepsi or Coca-Cola, you know. Now this brother, directly there's, the scholars differ whether can you ban Coca-Cola or Pepsi or, or together, etc. Now this, whatever view is given by different scholars, there's no direct verse in the Quran that you should do or should not do. So the scholars do differ. If it's not directly mentioned in the Quran the Hadith, the ijma of the scholars come and then it may differ. But there are scholars who say that if you want to show our distress, one of the way of showing our distress that find that we disagree with the policy laid down by a particular government or America, etc. and we ban the products. And if this is really going to help our cause, it should be done. If it's not going to help our cause, depend, you know, so mainly it depends upon how well we do it. Any act we do, if it's going to help the cause, I feel we should do it. If it's not going to help our cause, it is not worth doing it. Now that will differ in situation to different countries. In different countries, the situation is different, the people are different, you know. So depending on the situation, etc., the local ulma of that place should decide whether it should be foreign or not. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Before I take the next question, can I just make a couple of announcements, please, okay? Um, you are handed in a, a small leaflet about email. Would you kindly, when you finish with it, before you leave, would you kindly hand it into the IPCI stand? And if you can't do that, would you be kind enough to post it to IPCI? Yeah, that, if I may just show you, that is the leaflet I'm referring to. And the second one is Islam denounces terrorism. And these small leaflets are available from the IPCI stands. And I would suggest them. Yeah. If you can see that, that's the leaflet that's available. And if you'd like to go, um, if you so wish to, please pick it up from the IPCI stand as well. And uh, Dr. Naik is ready for the next question. Thank you. Brother, my name is Atta Muhammad Yam. My question is that most places today are not going to work. It is a good job. And going to be the job for every single person is staying over here. Job of that is job. Most of them are not going to work in the ground. And most of them have a God understanding of the ground. Until we will not have understanding of God, we will not have understanding of God from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are in wrong Islam to the Muslim, Muslim and non-Muslim. This is what is happening in the world. Any scholar spending wrong Islam I hear until now. And because they have not put the first to understand God and they have not passed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give the understanding of Islam. And if you do not have understanding of Islam, don't give lecture, otherwise you will despise our new generation and old people and non-Muslims. Uh,
excuse me. Sorry, excuse me. May I please interrupt you? Thank you very much for your short lecture. Excuse me, let me speak for a minute. I would like to thank you for your short lecture, but please would you ask a question and not make statements only. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, can you, yes, just hold on a second. Sorry, the question was not very clear. Can you just ask, repeat that for us again? Thank you. What, how should you react to the exercise that is happening at the moment in Afghanistan and the West? What should be our reaction to such a thing? How should we react to that extreme? If I heard the question correctly, when I said, what should be our reaction to what's happening in USA? Cuba. <coughs> in Cuba. Cuba. To the prisoners in Cuba. The brother asked a question. That's it, that's it. I'm wondering what is the basic question now. But the question, the brother asked him, what should our reaction be that the prisoners of Taliban and Al-Qaeda have been put in Cuba? What should our reaction be? We have to go first, what happened after the 11th of September, right or wrong, that you should realize. And as today's talk is terrorism in the name of Islam, my reaction is that this what they're doing is nothing but terrorism in the name of Islam. That means they're terrorizing the people in the name, in the garb of Islam. That if someone has to do something, fine. Inshallah, we'll continue. That we have to realize. Is it on the mask? No, can continue. So recording shows us can continue. Okay, we can continue. Fine. Sorry for the interruption. It's a tape. The terrorism in the name of Islam, as I mentioned, that if person has to do something, if they have to put, they have to catch a scapegoat and blame it on someone. So what I feel that what happened after the 11th of September, who has done it, we don't know at all. Allah wa alam who has done it. I don't know it and no one has the proof except for a couple of people and they aren't willing to share it. They say they claim they have the proof, but no one knows at all. And I say that what happened on the 11th of September, the crash on the Twin Tower, but natural, it is sure the, the crash, the attack on the Twin Tower, Islam denounces it. That generally, you know, killing thousands of people as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32. That if anyone kills any human being, unless it be for murder or for, for creating mischief in the land, it's as though he has killed of humanity. He has killed the whole of humanity. So based on this, the Islamic viewpoint that what happened there is we denounce it. What happened is wrong. And we have our condolences with the people who suffer. That's one aspect of it. But on the other hand, what happened after that? Who did it? We don't know. Who is the cause? We don't know. There are various theories, hypotheses floating in the market that who did it there's no proof at all it is just a prime suspect they say that you know Osama bin Laden was a prime suspect according to George Bush but I don't know I cannot say that Osama bin Laden is good I cannot say he's bad I don't know Allah Allah but surely what I can say that whether Osama bin Laden is right or wrong Allah Allah I haven't met him I don't know but surely what I can say that who is the real terrorist is George Bush because it has been proved and he spoken himself on the television and George Bush himself that without any proof he attacks a country which is the least equipped so we as Muslims we disagree totally with the stand taken by America the stand taken by George Bush imagine without any proof just as a prime suspect prime suspect you are bombarding a country which is the least equipped you know it is against all intellect and if we analyze that the reply given by Taliban, they do agree with it, 
the reply that they gave that you give us proof that Osama bin Laden is really the culprit and we will hold him at trial in our Sharia, Islamic Sharia. That's the best reply. The point to be noted according to the international laws, according to the international law, there is an extradition policy. That if there's extradition policy between two foreign countries and if a culprit of one country, if a person has broken a law in one particular country, and if he goes to another country, that country has to give hand over that person back if proof is given. For example, India and UK has the extradition policy. And you may have heard that there was an Indian music director by the name of Nadim. You know, he, there was an allegation that he was involved in a murder case. And according to the Indian government, they had proof. I don't know whether he was involved or not, but according to the Indian government, they had proof. But when he came to UK, and when they asked UK to hand over Nadim to them, though they had proof, they said, we will hold him at trial in our court. And in this court, they were not able to prove that Nadim was involved, that the, the evidence given by the Indian government was insufficient according to the UK government. So they did not hand him over, even though they had the extradition policy. So here you realize that Afghanistan and America does not have extradition policy. So they cannot ask, even if whether someone, a culprit of USA, if he goes to Afghanistan, that they can ask him back. And even if they had extradition policy, they have to prove in the court of law that he's really the culprit. Without giving proof, if they attack a country, any logical person will agree that this is terrorizing the innocent people. And here, the scapegoat that they took here, the scapegoat was Islam. And it was actually not a war against terror, it was war against Islam according to me. It was a war against Islam. Though it became on the scene and always war against terror, war against terror, it was war against peace actually. War against peace. And that's why I quote in my talk, the article written by Aun Adati Roy, the Hindu journalist of India, that we learn from America, that pigs are horses and females are males and war is peace. That means they wanted to catch a squib goat and there are various theories. Who did it? There are even theories that Jews did it. There are theories that George Bush himself did it. So do you mean to say that I, I lay and say that, okay, now you hand over George Bush to us, otherwise we'll bombard America? You'll call me a lunatic. If I say that I have a theory George Bush did it, and if you ask me for proof, I said, I don't know, I don't want to give the proof. It will spoil all my chances of catching him. Now you, you hand over George Bush, otherwise we'll bombard America. You'll call me a lunatic. But this is exactly what was done. So what, according to me, I surely say that as far as Osama bin Laden is concerned, I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but surely as far as George Bush is concerned, and all those who supported him, I feel they are supporting terrorism against innocent people. And we condemn it. And after that, they're bombarding a country, and you find, and you could see on the media, that you could see that they are dropping millions of dollars of bombs to destroy a just a thousand dollar house. And you could see that many of the Muslims, you know, that they, that come on the interview, they said, no problem, you are spending millions of dollars and only a thousand dollar house is going. They were even willing, alhamdulillah. And finally, they catch the people and they can come to the main question that what should the Muslims stand be? But naturally, if they catch, first of all, they were, they had no right to attack a country without any proof. We condemn that act itself and now taking them prisoners of war without any proof, we condemn it. We surely do not support such act. And we say this is nothing but terrorism. And Islam denounces such kind of terrorism. It's open terrorism. And we have to say that what George Bush is doing and what America is doing is nothing but terrorizing, terrorizing the, the innocent people. And there are various theories. People say it was an inside job. And many people say it's impossible. It's impossible that this could be planned by Al-Qaeda, such a small network. People from America themselves, the Americans, if you go on the internet, they say it's impossible. It has to be an inside job. It has to be an inside job. And what is the reason? And there are statistics given by the non-Muslims that the reason they did it is because, again, hypothesis, I'm not saying it's a fact. They say that just to earn trillions of dollars, the oil that they're going to get in Afghanistan, they wouldn't mind sacrificing a few billion dollars, you know. It's a good bargain. Again, all these hypotheses are not given by Muslims, it is given by non-Muslims. And surely, it cannot be that you can go into a plane and bombard a 
Bamar a building with just a few hours of training. It's impossible. There have been statements of pilots who have flown for years over New York. They say for others it's difficult to maneuver such a thing. It has to be pre-planned. So again, all these are hypotheses. Who did it allow Alam? But since they didn't have the proof what America did, we condemn it and we condemn keeping hostages without any proof. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Um, before I take another question, I'd just like to show a written question to Dr. Nayak and see if you'd like to answer that one first. <clears throat> the question posed is, is the concept of suicide bombings allowed as a part of Jihad in Islam from Imran Ali? Regarding the concept, is suicide bombing allowed in Islam or not? There are different opinion. And if you hear the fatwas, I'll just give the opinion of the different scholars and you make your own judgment. I'm not a mufti. I'm just a student of comparative religion. If you read the fatwa of Sheikh bin Baz and Sheikh Nasir al Almani and Sheikh Utaymi, all three great stalwarts, alhamdulillah, all Salaf scholars, the great scholars, all three, they have denounced. They say that suicide bombing is haram. Based on the verse of the Quran, that suicide per se is haram, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 195, that make not your own hands the cause of your own destruction. So based on this, and several other hadith, the suicide is haram, these top scholars have said that suicide bombing is forbidden. But on the other hand, you have other scholars, like Sheikh Salim Munajid, who is also a great Salah scholar from Saudi Arabia, and other scholars who are also supported. What they say, the suicide per se is haram, but this bombing done by the Muslims like in Palestine, etc. This fatwa was given, but naturally all these three great scalwards, Sheikh Nasir al-Albani, Sheikh bin Baz and Sheikh Utaymi, all of them are expired. These fatwa were given much before 11th of September, based on the question asked that the Palestinians, when they tie a bomb and they go in a marketplace and blow up, is it allowed or not? This fatwa was based on that. So Sheikh Salim Munajid says that under normal circumstances, suicide is haram. But this bombing that people do, they tie a bomb and they go and attack and kill the enemy, should it be called suicide or not, it's a misnomer. Because suicide by definition means a person is fed up of life and he wants to end his life. His main objective is to end his life. Like a person jumps from a 10-story building, he wants to end his life, he's fed up of life, a person takes poison. His main objective is to end his life. In these cases, where certain Muslims went, you know, where they thought, you know, that we have been killed every day in hundreds of numbers, as if we are going to die, so why not we go and try and cause a loss to the enemy? So here, the main intention was not to die. The main intention was to cause a loss to the enemy. And they knew that while doing this, there are high possibilities of dying. But no one can say 100% will die. Because only Allah knows whether a person will die or not. And we know several suicide bombers who have been caught and they have not died. So life and death in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Sheikh Salim Munaj says, and other scholars like Sheikh Jafar Idris, etc., what they say that it should not be done normally, but as a last resort, if there's no other way, and since Muslims are being killed, instead of that they take this act so that certain of the enemies also killed, who are involved in tyranny and oppression, they say as a last resort it can be used. And the example certain scholars give, that at the time of Battle of Badr, we know the history, that we were, the Muslims were approximately 300, and the enemies were thrice the number, more than a thousand. And the enemies, the Mushriks and the Kafirs, they had more animals, they had more weapons, more horses, more camels, much more. So a modern expert of war will say that 300 people ill-equipped, fighting a thousand people with so much of equipment, it's nothing but suicide. So modern men will call this suicide. But the Sahaba at that time, they had the, they had the taqwa, they had the iman, they said we'll go and fight injustice, even if we have to die, we are prepared for it. But the main intention was to fight the people ordering injustice. That was the main intention. And Alhamdulillah, you, you found that they got victory. Here, if you compare the suicide bombing, I do agree that the chance of dying in suicide bombing is much higher, if you think logically, as compared to battle of Badr. But yet again, if the intention is not to end your life, it is to cause loss to the enemies who are, who are causing problems and tie and oppression. Then these scholars like Sheikh Salim Munajir, Sheikh Jafar Idris, they say as a last resort, it can be done. Now you are the people who can make the choice of the fatwa given by, given by two groups of great scholars. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Now may we have uh, the next question, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
question that they were programmed on BBC and they tried to brainwash the people that the Muslims think that if you die and fight in the way of Allah you will get paradise <clears throat> and as I quoted in my talk there's a hadith of beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu which is from Sahih Bukhari volume number 4 hadith number 46 in which the Prophet said that a mujahid one who strives in Allah's way and Allah alone knows whether he strives in his way or not that means the Prophet said a mujahid but whether he's a mujahid or not a true mujahid in the true sense actually is striving in Allah's way or not Allah alone knows but if he's actually striving in Allah's way and if he dies in the battlefield he will get paradise that's what the prophet said but whether he is a true mujahid or not Allah alam that's the reason when many a time some of the sahaba said this person died you know in the way of Allah he'll go to paradise the prophet how do you know how do you know so only 100% guarantee is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the prophet says so here we realize that if a person is truly fighting for Allah's cause that means what we say is fighting against tyranny and oppression for example in any country if a soldier is fighting the war and if he dies or if he's killed if his body is brought back to the country he gets a gun salute yes or no it's a gun salute he gets an honor and in America they put the American flag on his coffin so same way there we salute the soldier why because he was fighting for the cause of the country Similarly in Islam, if a person truly dies in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, truly dies fighting against oppression and tyranny, to let peace prevail in this world, to let Islam prevail, to let peace prevail, inshallah, inshallah, that person will get Jannah. And that paradise is far superior than the gun salute. It is far superior than putting the flag over the body. And this is the reward a person will get. But I do agree with you. The media, the media projects a negative picture. They're trying to project that, oh, Muslims, if they kill non-Muslim, Quran promises paradise. And unfortunately, unfortunately, many Muslims also start agreeing with it. Unfortunately. Like you could see, there are Muslims agreeing with it. I mean, where does the Quran say that if you kill any mushrik, you get paradise? Where does the Quran say? In fact, Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 32, if, you, if anyone kills any human being, whether Muslim or mushrik or kafir, unless it be for murder or for creating mischief in the, in the land it's as though he has killed the whole of humanity so where does Quran give you permission to kill any kafir where does the Quran give you permission to kill any mushrik and if, if anyone says jihad is only meant for the mushrik to kill them I mean if they're having a problem if they're creating a problem if they're doing tumult and oppression that is the reason why you can do it so this media I do agree with the brother they create a negative picture which we as Muslims should speak out the truth and we should clarify the misconception what they have. Hope that answers the question. The brother asked a question that there are about 200 million Muslims in India. The government claims 110, 120 million. Some claim 200 on average. You can say 150, 160 million to be on the safe side. And there are Hindus in India and there's a conflict which took place about nine years back, the Babri Masjid demolition. And now again it erupted a few days back, just a day before I left Bombay. And the whole, whole of India was closed and 
when I read in the news, when I heard in the news it was about 80 people had been killed and now someone told me it's more than 300 of the Muslims have been killed. The brother is asking the world of this conflict and, and what should the Muslims do? Brother, this is more of a political issue according to me. It is not a religious issue. It is more of a political issue that if a particular party wants to win the elections, they bring a play card in which they can gather the votes. What I believe that if the Muslim leaders would have seen through the plan, then the situation would not have come into existence. We were more of emotion, we were emotional. If you would have seen that the main thing is not whether they want to build a temple or not, the main thing was to gather votes. And you see that, you know, whether Ram was born or not, there are several books written that, you know, written by the Hindus that Ram wasn't born there. And there are claims that Ram was born in about four or five different places of India. So that's a different issue. Whether Ram was born or not, there's no historical record at all that Ram was born there. But in spite of this, if we Muslims would have dealt the situation with Hikmah, what they wanted, they wanted to create an atmosphere in which they could let, let this issue live so that every time they can make use of this issue and they don't target any Muslim place they can target. And that's what they did a few days back. If you have seen on the news, hundreds of Muslims have been targeted. They have been systematically targeted. What we should do, the Muslims internationally should get together and should once and for all sit together and solve this problem because even for so many years, no one ever prayed in Babri Masjid. It was closed. No one knew Babri Masjid existed. Even I didn't know, believe me. I didn't know Babri Masjid existed also. And most of the Muslims, more than 90% of the Muslims, you can say safely, did not know Babri Masjid existed in India. So when someone tries to use certain issue for his benefit, we Muslims should get together and the Muslim leaders would have got together and solved this amicably without letting them make a issue out of it. That would have been the best solution to come to a compromise and see to it that we have what we want also. At the same time, they do not make it an issue and close the issue forever. Don't let it be there so that they can again ignite it and make an excuse to create rights. Hope that answers the question. I will now take uh, another written question and uh, the questioner has not actually given his or her name and says, why do some Muslims believe that politics is not part of Islam when our whole life is politics? The sister has a question that why do some Muslims believe that politics is not part of Islam and the whole life is politics? Sister, you have to go and ask those Muslims, why are you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Islam, as Allah says in the Quran, Islam is a deen, it's a complete way of life. You can't say the whole life is politics, but politics is part of life. Islam is not a religion, religion doesn't denote the complete meaning. Islam is more, it's a deen, it's a complete code of conduct. And if you read in the Quran, the authentic hadith, the Prophet has showed how a person should live, how he should lead a life, how he should do business, how he should behave as a husband, as a wife, as a father, as a mother, politics, social life. MashaAllah, it's a complete code of conduct. So there is something like politics in Islam, though I'm not a specialist of politics, I'm more of a specialist of comparative religion. But there is politics in Islam, and you can see the best example which is given in, in the life of the Prophet Muhammad and the Khulfa Rashidin. Hope that answers the question. Um, I'll take another written question now. Um, it says, how can we stop the West and U.S. killing the Muslims and what is the solution? The question posed is that how can we stop the West from killing the Muslims and what is the solution? The best solution as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran chapter number 3 verse number 103, it tells the Muslims, hold the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. If all the Muslims hold together strongly to the Quran, the rope of Allah, and the authentic hadith, inshallah will be strong. What's happening today is the Muslims are divided. Not only here, throughout the world. In India they're divided. If we Muslims get together as one single force, Alhamdulillah, we are more than a billion. We are more than a billion. More than one-fifth of the world population. It's a Big block. You know the Jews, they're such a small, minute percentage of the full world population. Yet, they can control many things. They control the money market, they control various things. If we Muslims are united, the first thing what we should do is unite. And the only way the Muslim Ummah can unite is on the basis of the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. 
and I'm aware that the various groups and the various sects in Islam, this can be united on the basis of Quran and the Sunnah, Quran and the authentic Hadith. If we do that, and then inshallah, then inshallah, if we speak as one force, then we'll have better results. Now, a Muslim gets scared to open his mouth to speak against America or speak, you know, and we find that most of the Muslims, you know that all this would happen in 11 September. All the Muslims condemned it, except those who are involved with government levels. Very few spoke up. Most of the people involved in government level, they were afraid that if we speak up, you know, we'll get the backlash, etc. And what we are failing to understand, that if we are true Muslims, Allah promises in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 160. If Allah helps you, none can overcome you. And if Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? So let the believers put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we Muslims are, we are afraid more of other things than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We feel other things are more superior than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We say, we love Allah, we think Allah is the most powerful, but believe me, we don't, we don't actually mean it. Allah says, if Allah is with you, none can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? So let the believers put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if every Muslim agrees that you're on the straight path, you follow the Quran and the Sunnah, and you, are, and you know that Allah is with you, then you will not feel scared of speaking the truth. And if you do that, and if you come as a united force, and then if you bring a pressure to anyone who does oppression, Inshallah, we'll get results. Today we aren't united, therefore the pressure is not working. If we are united, now you know, so don't, don't blame the finger only on the Muslim countries. Let us as Muslim unite at least out here in London. Leave aside other. Let us unite in London, then in UK, then in Europe. Let's start at home. First, it's very easy to point the finger. Oh, it's the fault of the Muslim countries. You know, if we were there, we would have done good. What are you doing? So what I say at the individual level first, let the Muslim unite together on an individual level. On an individual level, on the society level, and then inshallah, if this continues, inshallah will be one force, if not today, at least tomorrow. And we should go back to Quran and the Sunnah. If you go back to the Quran and the Sunnah and unite, inshallah, we will again be the torn brothers of the world. Hope that answers the question. Um, we are only going to take one final question. Thank you very much. Excuse me, we can't hear you very well. Can you speak up kindly? Thank you. I was asked on September 11th whether I would fundamentally the strong order. I answered I would like to be a fundamentalist uh, simply because I think it's inherent to religion. However, that, that this is the Sorry, can I please interrupt you? Uh, you haven't asked a question yet. Can you ask a question? Oh, sorry. Sorry, can we just answer the first question, then we'll see if we, we have time for the second one. To ask the question that he had been asked that is he a moderate or a fundamentalist and he said he would like to be a fundamentalist. He's asking that what is our organization or the other Muslim organization doing to combat this image of fundamentalists, you know, that we're terrorists, etc. That's what we are doing. You see that taking the example of IPCI, they've organized this lecture tour so that you can get the how to reply to the non-Muslims and how to convey the message of Islam to the others. The Islam Research Foundation in Bombay, we are doing the job. We are collaborating together, alhamdulillah. How to reply? The thing is there that we Muslims, we are apologetic. You know, many of the Muslims are ashamed to call themselves Muslims because the moment they identify themselves as Muslims, there will be questions asked as that which we won't be able to reply. So that's the reason many educated Muslims, they are apologetic. They are afraid to identify themselves as Muslims. That's the reason Muslims are afraid to wear cap, keep a beard. Even in Bombay, in India, you know, at one time this cap and beard had a respect. But now, it has an image that if you want to do dadagiri, if you want to do extortion, if you want to bully someone and you wear a cap and you know, that's the image. Now, the image is there. Who's to blame? We are to blame. So what we have to do, I say that okay, the image is there. The wearing a cap like means that you are a ruffian. 
what I say that at least I will be the first person who will wear a cap and keep a beard if not the others and prove to the world okay at least there's one Muslim who wears a cap and a beard and who's who's not a ruffian who is not doing extortion tomorrow there'll be two then there'll be ten then there'll be hundred and inshallah again this respect for this cap and the beard will be reinstated you can refer to my video cassette if the label shows your intent to wear it which gives more details regarding what we are doing that alhamdulillah we are producing programs and showing on satellite television channels what we lack today is that we do not have a 24 hour full time Islamic channel which can portray our view alhamdulillah the Islamic Research Foundation in Bombay we show our program on the cable TV network every day for 2 to 3 hours to 1.2 million homes there's no other city in the world where the Muslim and non-Muslim which I know of which every day shows about 3 hours Dawa program to 1.2 million homes and we are doing it through the non-Muslims and since the past few years we have gone on the satellite television channels and alhamdulillah we are producing programs for satellite television channels and at present we are reaching more than 100 countries in the world every day for half an hour we are covering most of the countries in Europe most of the countries in Africa all the countries in Middle East all the countries in Asia alhamdulillah and we are showing programs which give the replies to these things and now if you say that if you someone in the fund like for example me I said it very openly I'm a fundamentalist and I say and I challenge anyone to point out a single fundamental which is against humanity at large so if you know the reply to these questions you will not feel shy and we whatever we can do we have to dispel the misconception and there are organizations working in UK as well as other parts of the world which are trying to educate the people about the right teachings of Islam hope that answers the question thank you I'm sorry, but we haven't got any more time to... No, I'm sorry, we have to close. It's 7 o'clock and we have to close. So I would ask Mr. Abdul Haq to say a short prayer. Thank you. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihin nabiyil kareem. Rabbana hatina fi dunya hasana. وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكوننا من الخاسرين اللهم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين واخذل الكفرة وال واخذل الكفرة والمبتدعة والمشركين اللهم شت شملهم اللهم مزق جمعهم وأنزل بهم بأسك الذي لا ترده عن القوم المجرمين اللهم وفقنا لما تحب وترضاه اللهم وفقنا لما تحب وترضاه اللهم وفق لا المسلمين وعامتهم وصلى الله تعالى على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين